Hey, turtles. Hey, Shadow. something a little different. We haven't done a photo editing stream in a while. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time. I went out birding and uh, I need to touch up these photos. Hey Sarah, how you doing? We're looking at some birds. Um, oh, this is uh, an image from, I think I collect this from the stream that we did on Saturday or Sunday morning. Uh, I'm making cornbread. I love cornbread. Um, so I'm just trying to, to clean up the images a little bit. Um, one, I'm working on, so this is Lightroom that I'm in, but um, so this picture came out kind of shadowed and I'm trying to get rid of the shadow, nothing personal shadows. Um, two, You can see that the pictures have a little bit of a green to them, uh, a sort of, um, I don't know, it's a slightly less sharp, but it's not because of the quality of the image, it's because there's uh, a little bit of noise. So um, I'm going to work on trying to hand these through to Photoshop. And then the camera is like where I need to see all the time, no matter where I put it. Um, and then we'll bounce over to Photoshop, I hope. Let's see if I can manage this. Yeah. And I don't really have a whole lot to do in Photoshop. Uh, I, don't, I don't like to touch up my images too much. Hey Mel, you're lurking without sound. Oh, you're sort of in class. Since she can't hear us. Um, there's not a whole lot to hear anyway, just me blathering on. Uh, this is a white-throated uh, sparrow that we saw on stream. So um, characterized by these uh, um, yellow eyebrows, I guess. I don't know what you want to call those. And then uh, it's got like a, a very distinct white, like a bib under its chin. You can see this one's been digging around in the dirt a little bit. Um, it's, uh, it's got a bit of a mess on its face. Really, I just handed this over to, um, to Photoshop because I wanted to bounce it through Topaz Labs to try to clean up the image a little bit. Um, and then I'll sh I don't think I can sort of show you the Topaz lab side of it, but um, I'm gonna let it sharpen the image a little bit and then I'll bounce it back and you can kind of look at the difference in the quality. Uh, it, it seems to help a lot with the noise. Um, for these images, the, the noise is partly generated by the fact that um, I'm I'm shooting into my backyard, and um, you can see that the sun is actually sort of um, on the back side of the bird, and so uh, it's a little bit dark on the side where I am. If I'd you know if I'd been on the other side of my yard, 
the birds would be very bright. So I had to turn my ISO up a little bit to make sure that they weren't going to be motion blurred. And I threw out a bunch of images because they were already motion blurred. Um, you know, when I took them, basically, I decided they weren't good enough. And so in order to kind of balance the, um, the fact that there's uh, not enough light to capture the image clearly without a little bit of motion blur, I adjust for this, all photographers adjust for this darkness by basically turning their ISO up on their camera. Hey, diatoms, welcome in. Uh, you can see I've got you automatically shouted out already um, here. Um, this isn't a diatom stream, I'm just, I did do some birding, and so this is like a photo editing stream. Uh, checking in before your Tuesday stream, thanks for the raid. Yeah, thanks for dropping in. Um, we have a, uh, if you don't know who Diatoms is, um, they are a streamer from San Francisco Bay Area, so kind of like Pacific Plankton, and uh, they do a bunch of uh, microscopy, and mostly stream into the uh, zoos and animals section, I think. Um, the camera, I actually have three cameras, but they're all basically the same model. Um, I think it's in the other room. Um, so mounted onto my microscope is an Olympus OMD EM1 Mark II. And the bird streaming camera, or the camera that I used for, um, for streaming the moon or thunderstorms or anything where I'm doing photography, is actually the next model up from that, the Olympus OMD EM1 Mark III. And then I have a little Mark uh, EM. This one here is the, uh, still got a battery stuck in it, hang on. Gotta unlock it. So this is the uh, my first camera from the set. This is the Olympus OMD EM5 Mark II. And so all of the cameras basically use the same uh, mirrorless body, which means that the um, sensor is basically directly in, there's no mirror. And it allows me to, um, use very shortened lenses because they don't have to have as big of a, um, a lens length because they're not bouncing through a mirror. And as a result, uh, these images that you're seeing were collected with um, what would be an equivalent to a 1600 millimeter uh, camera lens, but it's something that basically I can just carry around very easily. So I like that about it. Um, the quality is just as good, in my opinion, as most things, except for the full frame, uh, which has a slightly higher quality um, for the image, but also much more expensive. Um, and then all of my uh, lenses can be interchanged between all of the cameras, um, which is nice for me because if my wife and I go out, I can give her a camera if I wanted to. I could give one to my daughter. That way we could all use stuff um, and I can just interchange the lenses. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, uh, good question. So, and, um, that information can actually just be, uh, grabbed from, uh, here, uh, if you're wondering. Yeah, um, well, these are, um, the mirrorless cameras are, well, so let's see, Olympus changed their brand for the cameras, basically, um, so somebody else sort of bought the company and still making more or less the same bodies. But um, after the, they've got a new body that's just come out that it, um, I don't know, I might get it. I don't know. Uh, I don't really need like four. It's slightly better in a lot of ways than the um, EM1 Mark III. But uh, I think that's the last one that'll actually have the Olympus name on the body, but all the same lenses and the glass is all the same. So. Um, I guess we'll see what happens with it, but um, yeah, so um, let me get back to diatoms. They do uh, streaming through their microscope um, into Twitch, obviously, uh, here, and you can give them a checkout. Uh, they they uh, sort of can do, because they live on the coast, they can do fresh and marine um, samples. and. Uh, they look at all kinds of microorganisms, not just diatoms. So similar to the evening streams that I do, um, 
uh, here and uh, we'll always try to support other microscope streamers on Twitch. Um, if you don't, um, let's see, if you don't uh, follow any of the microscope streamers, I have a whole big list. I think I actually have it disabled right now, but um, I just add them to the channel so it cycles through. So it just shouts out people all the time, including uh, Cyanophyte. Welcome in, Cyanophyte, by the way. Uh, I don't know why yours is not shouting out automatically like it should, but um, we could just do it like a caveman. Uh, it's probably because I have a typo somewhere. Yours should be auto-shouting out as well. Um, please give Sano Fight a follow too. Um, they also stream from Microscope occasionally here on Twitch. Bulba got shouted out automatically, see? And, uh, what, Sarah, did you get shouted out? As so many people came in. Yeah, Sarah got automatically shouted out. Good. Um, this is like, uh, streamers mostly come to my channel, I think, which is cool. <laughs> Thanks for changing the color, Mel. Um, how's it going, Bulba? We're looking at birds. Um, if you like, uh, bird photography or bird art, um, our friend Boba is an artist here on Twitch. They um, they take pictures of birds and they turn them into paintings of birds. And uh, they have a really cool sort of technique, some sort of abstract background painting that they do. And then... <laughs> and then... <laughs> he broke in symmetry. And then... Uh, and they, they carve out like... A, a sort of a template of the outline of the things that are most important in the bird and uh, use that to paint over these sort of abstract images and so uh, lots of great not just birds uh, they also do like pets and uh, animals basically so uh, very cool um, you're having the worst day Mel oh, I'm sorry to hear that um, I don't know. My day was mostly working through trying to describe some species. We've got a paper that's um, that's been reviewed, and I've got to get it back to the editor. And I sat on it for like two months, um, but it's like five new species that I'm describing, and uh, I need to to get it done. And I got maybe like a third of it done. The editing. It's not actually that much work, but. Um, uh, it's challenging to kind of, if it, I haven't worked on it for like four months now, so like trying to get my brain back into like what I need uh, and how I need to change the paper. But um, yeah, so um, let's see. You're stressed out? Is it because you're uh, you're behind on your, your projects? Um, okay, so we ran this through uh, we're in Photoshop right now. We ran this through the Topaz Labs, so I just want to uh, zoom in so you can kind of get a sense of what Topaz Labs uh, was doing. Um, here you can see the quality of the plumage on the feathers here is a lot better now than it was. Um, there's uh, still sort of like a slight blur um, up around here that's from motion, um, but I think it's, you know, it's acceptable for me basically. Um, and so I'm just going to save it from here. Uh, give me a second. I should really plan ahead. This uh, will save as a TIFF file, um, just to make it accessible for later on. And then I think I'll probably just do like a quick PNG because uh, every time I try to post anything to Discord or whatever, anything that's like a actual social media outlet, uh, it chokes on the size of my files because these are raw images coming out of the camera at like 30 megabytes. And uh, if I turn them into a TIFF, they go to like 100 megabytes. So if I put them as a PNG file, the quality goes down a little bit, but um, I can at least post them then um, to somewhere. All right, let's jump back to Lightroom. And I will tuck Photoshop away for the moment. 
and we'll move to the next picture. Um, it's relatively easy um, editing. This is a, uh, a kill deer. So again, um, just a bird that I saw while I was out. Um, kill deer are really kind of funny birds. Um, they're goofy looking. They've got these big weird uh, eyes. And also, um, they're very famous for um, if if you try to approach them and they're near their nest, usually their nests are in rocky areas, and if you try to approach them, they um, they fake like they've got a broken wing uh, to distract you from the eggs, and they do this sort of like dance around crying uh, like they've got a broken wing to lead you away from where their nest is to protect their... Uh, their children, uh, you know, unhatched children, and um, I like them uh, because I, orange is one of my favorite colors, and they've got these like bright orange eyes, but they're almost impossible to get to stop moving uh, long enough to get a good image of, so. Sleep deprivation and deadlines. Oh, you lost your car, cyanophyte. That sounds terrible. Um... Yeah, so um, I just wanted to do like a real quick edit on this. Um, I want to try to get rid of the shadows again. This is like the main thing that I fight with, um, you know, for photography. And then um, I just want to boost the saturation because it looks a little pale, um, which is another thing that happens a little bit is the color gets adjusted when you're um, too much shadow, basically. I was playing tricks like tiny round <laughs> devils. <laughs> The solution, do you want to put a googly eye on my googly eyed bird? Okay, we can do that. Uh, give me a second. I'm, we're only going to put one eye on the bird because I feel like it already has one eye uh, showing. And if I do two, uh, I don't know where to put the other eye. But um, let's see, we'll take this. I need to... Uh... Oh, OBS is just ignoring me. That's interesting. Hmm. I'm not sure why that's happening. Uh -huh. You want to put it on the bird? Like, like where the eye goes? Like a googly eye. I want to see like the a little bit of the eyes, the bird's iris, or you want it to be the whole eye. Or you want to make them like a super big eye, like comically big eye, like this. You like that? Okay. This is what you were hoping for. Um, and then you should be able to Google that. You should just be able to 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 googly and uh, and. Also, uh, a one-eyed uh, mustachio will also Google down in the corner. Um, is it not spinning when everybody else googlies? Oh, you guys haven't tried it. Gotta, you, you gotta googly the eye, otherwise it won't spin. Um, if we were gonna put the other eye on, What do you think would be the least derpy? Or maybe the most derpy? If we put it here? Uh, or we could put it like like someplace really crazy. That's good, actually. I like that. Now it's like uh, bug-eyed on the other side, right? And uh, we'll just googly that. There you go, Disillusioned. Um, thank you for being a subscriber, Disillusioned, by the way. We're going to hide those for now. Oh, I hit it right before you googlied. That'll teach you to wait too long. Um, okay, let's... Uh, Yeah, yeah, the bird will protect its egg with trickery. Yeah, it it, um, it does a little dance and it flaps one of its wings. They're very famous for that behavior. 
um, it's pretty pretty entertaining. Okay, uh, here's another picture, same bird, uh, just uh, the other side of it. Um, but you can see bright orange eye, white striped eyebrow with a black eye line, uh, typical uh, for the bird. And then, uh, let's see, these are some cute little ducklings. Uh, they're actually Canadian geese, so they're goslings. Um, Canada geese, sorry. I always call them Canadian, but uh, they're Canada geese. Hey, Mel, we're sorry. Uh, oh, Mel, you didn't need to subscribe, but thank you for that. With your prime. Oh, I feel special now. It's like uh, you picked me out of all the people you could have had um, used your prime on. And now it rings when you talk, so there's that. Very nice. Uh, these little ducklings, uh, gooselings, goslings, um, were being protected by their mama, uh, of course. Uh, I have a bunch of pictures of them, and I don't know. I'm not sure about that one. This one's okay. Um, sometimes I just have to like sort through the images to figure out which ones I like. And, uh, and now you got all those cool emotes, so there's that. Um, I think maybe this one... I don't know. Uh, a or B? I think you can see a little more of its face in this one. I kind of like this one the best out of all of the little duckling images. Uh, very cute. Um, I'm trying to give it a little bit of that sort of... Um, uh, warm summery glow so just playing a little bit with the controls to do that um, I can actually tilt the temperature itself of the image um, just a little bit make it warmer like that yeah little goslings um, you can see if I zoom in again there's a little bit of a like I could fix this with Photoshop and I probably will um, you know there's just a little bit of like motion related blur. This is some, um, because the ISO is high, basically. Again, although this was really bright, um, so I'm not sure why it was fighting with it so much, but sometimes that happens. Um, but the images were collected with raw uh, image. That one's pretty good, actually. Uh, I just want to make it a little bit warmer, again. Um, you really gotta go, okay. <laughs> the, the emotes are pretty sweet, yeah. Um, thank you for that, Mel. Um, if you're not following our friend Mel, she is a musician. She's, uh, she plays ukulele and keyboard, and, um, I think she's, well, piano, and she's learning, uh, learning guitar. Uh, it's, it's a goose actually but a baby goose um it's a canada goose actually this is the way they look when they're little um and uh she's australian so uh, she she plays these sort of quirky fun songs and um i recommend that you give her a follow so and she's here she just subscribed sometimes she actually takes uh some of my streams from YouTube or whatever, and then uh, she does a little bit of like sound editing. She's working on making us some uh, music to play in the background so that I don't have to use Pretzel, uh, Pretzel Rock for background sound. So very excited about that. Here's another little goose. Uh, again, you can see um, it's, a, it's little web feet are now visible uh, in this one a little bit better. Um, not quite as much uh, of the view of the face. And I think that one's a little out of focus, so I don't really like that one as much. So we'll skip editing that. Um, this is a, a palm warbler um, that I saw. Um, these are pictures from uh, a local park near here, Hawthorne Park, City Park. And um, I took these on Saturday? I think Saturday afternoon. Um, I was 
I was out doing some birding, basically. Um, I haven't had a chance to kind of get out and do birding in a while, so um, I was pretty happy about that. It's, uh, it's approaching the end of the semester for us. This is the week before finals. And so um, something that people don't realize is like for professors, the, um, the workload for us is basically the exact opposite of whatever it is for the students. So as the semester goes along, um, it actually gets a little bit easier for us. We have less work. Um, more of the work sort of gets moved into like students working on projects or writing papers or something like that. And so, um, so you know, I have a little bit more spare time. Um, but if I let anybody know that I have any spare time, it instantly evaporates. So don't tell anybody. Um, yeah. So this is a palm warbler. Um, the warblers migrate um, every year um, into cooler conditions in the summer. So they travel basically from um, from places like uh, a little bit farther south from here um, up to Canada as the temperatures start to get warm. So we get this massive migration of them. And then um, in order to get over the Great Lakes, they just have a few places where there's enough habitat. It's not city. And um, where the pathway over the lakes is short enough that they can easily um, fly across it, like, you know, in half a day or something. And so before they make this big trek across the Great Lakes, they stop in several of these places along um, the the southern edges of the Great Lakes. And that means that they basically come right up to um, northern Indiana and northern Ohio um, before they sort of make this leap. And one of the places that they um, congregate in um, around the sort of Cleveland uh, area is um, uh, McGee Marsh. So I've gone there before to take pictures of warblers and um, with my sister and um, she goes there like two or three times every every migration so they have to basically cross over the Great Lakes and then come back um, so she's usually there for both ends of that and um, and so she gets basically uh, these birds all the time um, through going like traveling for about an hour to get up to this um, this marsh, it's about five hours from where I live though, so it's not really like a close um, pathway for me, and um, it's hard for me to make a five-hour trek just for some birds. So um, I usually don't get to go. But uh, last year I just sort of hung out in my yard and uh, paid a little bit more attention to what was going on with the birds as they were kind of migrating through. And um, I was able to capture almost all of the same warblers that um, I got when I went to McGee Marsh. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, this image of this warbler was a little bit uh, in shadow, as many of the bird images are. As I mentioned, we're always kind of fighting with um, with shadows because birds are usually hanging out under the trees and stuff. And so um, this has already been brightened basically so that we could see it a little bit better. Um, and uh, my, um, I'm gonna save a version of this. I kind of like this little image even though it's, um, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, I like this image even though it's a little bit grainy. Um, I don't think most people will notice when I go to um, post it, basically. It'll be too um, too low resolution for them to really see how grainy it is, um, which is, you know, it's fine. Let's see. And we'll jump back to Lightroom, kind of bouncing around a little. Be patient. Um, 
These are all the same. Oops. That same bird. It's still a palm warbler. Um, these ones were taken in the sun, though, so they've got a little bit more of the... Um, the image is a little clearer, for one, and they've got a little bit more of the natural color of the bird. So... Um, I kind of like the ones where you can see the bird looking upward, but... Uh, this is maybe more of its natural looking away. Um, so I kind of like this. And then also, um, for this image, the, the background is um, bow good, which is, you know, like just out of focus, basically, as well. fancy photographer language for out of focus stuff. And um, I really like the sky and the trees and the way that when they go out of focus they kind of make this brown and blue sort of striped background. Um, I think it adds a lot of context to the image and um, I'm going to pull that out a little bit by using uh, the clarity tool on Lightroom and I'm going to turn up the texture just a little bit because it um, uh, to get the sort of texture of the wood and a little bit more of the plumage and then um, I turned up the saturation just a bit, and then um, I think I'm going to turn up the brightness just a little bit because the clarity basically um, kind of darkened everything. Um, and I might just tweak this contrast a little. Um, for most of my photography, I just do things by like what looks good to me. So I just play with knobs and stuff until it looks right. And so, like, if, if people are asking me sometimes, like, how to do stuff, I'm like, I don't know. I just I just play around with it until it looks good to me. So, um, which is, you know, I think the way it should be, in my opinion. As long as you know what you're doing, as long as you know which knobs to twist. Um, that is a yellow rumped warbler. So another one of the warblers that sort of, uh, they don't... They don't usually, um, they don't go too far from where we are. So the migration usually means that, like, they, they're one of the first warblers to come into the area. And I started to see um, the uh, yellow rumped warbler here about um, maybe two weeks ago, uh, like ahead of all the other warblers. And, um, they live in, you know, in the trees around my house, so pretty common here. Um, but they don't stay through the winter here, so they, you know, they're not something that I would see in the winter time at all. But they started showing up in my yard. So um, we saw one in the stream last Saturday, and I think the Saturday before that I saw one, but we it didn't come down into the backyard at all. So it was more like um, in the yard, just not someplace where I could clearly. Uh, get it on to um, to image it. So again, I'm just sort of tweaking the um, the image a little bit, and um, these are shot. Uh, the images are shot sixteen nine or something ratio. Um, but the camera collects a 4x3 ratio no matter what I do. It's just, it puts an auto crop on there. And um, I like the sort of wide field view of these. Um, and I may actually, like, like for this one, um, I may actually reposition it to something that's a little bit more off-center, because uh, when I took the picture, it's, it's pretty, pretty much the bird was in the middle of the picture. And usually in photography, you don't really want to compose things that way. Um, and this is a normal struggle for me when I'm doing photography. I'm focused on getting the bird in focus. Um, that's the thing that I think is the most important. And so I spend all this time getting like a nice clean uh, picture of the bird. Warblers are kind of difficult to image already because they jump around a lot. They, they're like bug eating birds, so they hop up and down branches. They don't usually just sit there for very long. And so my focus is like, oh, I got it. I got to get the picture. And um, very rarely 
uh, stop to think about the composition. But one of the nice things about um, imaging stuff with a uh, high resolution, um, uh, you know, like 60 megapixel camera or whatever, 20 megapixel camera is that um, you don't really need to do composition. Um, you can just crop it for composition. So like if I don't like the way this one looks because the bird's not, you know, um, off center enough. Uh, the thing is you can just go ahead and edit it down and the image quality is so high that cropping it doesn't really, you know, you don't, you don't lose much basically. And then you can have your image still have nice quality for it um, and not have to worry about the fact that when you took it, you weren't thinking about composition. So um, my sister, who's an actual photographer, uh, like professional photographer for a living, um, she always spends all of her time like thinking about the composition and so she'll get it in focus and then pop back out to sort of a wide field view and then compose it and then take the picture. And I'm always just super lazy about composition and I figure I'll just crop it for composition later. I won't, um, I won't try to do it before um, we get to the point where <laughs> I actually have it in Photoshop or, or some sort of a, a tool and I just do all of my composition basically in Lightroom or Photoshop. Um, and I don't usually think it matters that much. I feel like I still get a pretty good image. Um, I'm usually on the other end of something else that, um, so my sister spends a lot of time also just, she turns her ISO way up and then just fixes it in Topaz. Um, with Topaz Labs to fix the graininess. And before I got Topaz, that's, I would do the opposite. I would just basically keep taking pictures. And if there was a little bit of blur, I kept trying to push the ISO as high as I could make it. Um, and I probably lost a lot of pretty good bird photos as a result. But so she just usually adjusts things on, um, on, you know, she just sets her ISO wherever she needs it to be in order to capture things that are moving. And I just wait until the birds are kind of sitting still and I try to be a little bit more patient about getting a clean image of them. Um, it means I get a lot of blurred uh, photos, but also, um, you know, when the pictures turn out, they have a little bit better resolution. So when I crop them, they don't look as bad again. So I just have like a style that kind of caters to that uh, approach. It's the same bird, a bunch of different views of it. It was sitting on a branch right in front of me. Um, this is probably the best of those. Uh, images aside from the other one. I like how the wind is kind of blowing the bird's feathers around a little bit. And um, the background's a little bit bright, but I um, actually don't mind it because it makes the bird kind of stand out. And then you still have these sort of faint hints in the background of something going on. Um, but I, you know, I think maybe I, I could get rid of some of the blue space around the outside edges. I'll try to adjust it. Um, and like I said, I don't, I mean, I think you can see the eye pretty clearly. I might get rid of a little bit of the shadow. <laughs> the pretzel rocks caused one of the magic words train to appear. Uh, it wasn't all birds. I got some turtles while I was out there. Um, this old guy is pretty um, interesting. His back is covered with all kinds of algae, and I think it's a uh, look at the look at the claws on this beast. So um, I don't think I got any really good images of his face, but um, I might be able to fix that a little bit in Topaz later. I can just play with a little bit of it. Uh, with the clarity tools for now, but um, pretty funny little turtle. Hey, Samsung, how you doing? Uh, Wolverine turtle, yeah. He's, uh, I can brighten him a little bit. Uh, but look at that camo he's got going on though, right? Um, he's he's uh, not just Wolverine, but he's also trying to blend in. Um, anyway. Uh, I have lots of good pictures of turtles, but I just kind of like the way this one was covered with uh, with moss.
Yeah, it's got a whole micro forest on a shell. I'd love to get in there and do a little scraping and then put it in the microscope and see what the turtle's carrying around. Um, I think that would be awesome. So, yes. Sorry. Uh, it's another box turtle, I think. Uh, there's red stripes on it. Um, the turtles usually see me coming and then they they duck out of the way pretty much the moment I get anywhere near them. Um, so I'm using my super long lens to basically get these images. Again, it's got a little bit of a biome on its back. Look at all this duckweed in the foreground and it's found itself a friendly log to hang out on. Um, probably good enough. Uh, I thought about Boba, if you're still around Boba, when uh, when I took this picture. It's a, uh, a blue-gray gnat catcher, which is, uh, I think, the thing that he most recently was uh, painting. And um, a lot of times when I'm out doing the actual birding, I don't remember all of the rare, rarer birds that I see. Um, and turtle sludge, yeah. There, uh, Diatom said, I thought you were already uh, out of here. Um, uh, there's um, a bunch of, uh, of diatomists who um, intentionally sample turtle shells. Um, and one of them is my friend Shelly Wu. So she did her PhD work on um, turtle, diatoms living on turtles. And um, uh, my friend Itzi, um, who's a co-author with me on the Afrocimbella uh, papers that we're describing new species from, um, also is a uh, uh, somebody who's done some studies of turtle and diatoms that live on turtles. And um, uh, we're looking for a couple of cool things that um, that I plan on getting from uh, from our friend Steve Mandel um, this year, which is uh, two things. One is turtle, not turtles, diatoms living on sloths, and uh, uh, he's got a person who works with a sloth uh, conservation, and they're going to send us some sloth scrapings or whatever. Um, and then like in peak algae season and then um, uh, he's also got some friends who are collecting diatom they're going to collect some diatoms for me from hippos so um, uh, this is like a I, I just mentioned it um, in the fall kind of like when somebody asked me well, what would I like to get my hands on for a sample and I was talking about um, like hippopotamus would be like the coolest thing to try to get diatoms from but like I don't want to monkey with a, a hippopotamus so um, uh, I mentioned this the Pacific and uh, as my Christmas present she talked Steve Mandel into talking to his friends about getting us some of that material so um, yeah they they um, they're going to try to get the diatoms off of them, not by scraping them, but by brushing the fur so that they collect whatever's in the fur. Um, but the hippopotami, they are tranquilizing them. Uh, and then, so he's got some friends who tag and tranquilize and uh, they do some sort of like analysis of hippopotamus. And uh, I don't know how, how it's going to get to me, but... Um, but the, there's a plan in place, basically, for for me to get some uh, hippopotamus scrapings, um, and I'm pretty excited about the idea of it. I don't know, maybe it'll just be boring, uh, regular old diatoms, but um, but I think it would be really an interesting um, paper, no matter what, because I doubt anybody's ever looked at a hippopotamus before and tried to figure out what's living on it. Um, this is more of that blue-gray gnat catcher. This is a um, yellow-rumped warbler, again. Um, pretty common around here, as I mentioned. Um, and then, what else do I have? This is still the yellow-rumped warbler. They have these like yellow patches on their shoulders. Um, people sometimes call these birds butter butts because they have like a yellow spot on their butt when they fly away. Um, 
it's wild what you research types get up to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I also thought about maybe snakes would be kind of cool, but um, I think you could probably sample snake skin pretty easily from uh, whatever they leave. Like the ISO is like makes that image look kind of grainy, so I'm gonna have to run this through um, uh, Topaz probably to get rid of some of the graininess, but I think I can probably salvage one of these. Um, this is this, uh, an egret. Um, I think it's a snowy egret. Um, you know, they're pretty similar to herons, though. Um, and we get great blue herons all the time, and green herons um, here pretty frequently as well. Um, so I've got better pictures of this, but um, this is when they um, when they go into mating season. They get like a green colored mask on their face, so um, it's mating season for uh, for the egret here. Um, I don't remember what color their face is normally, but the, the mask changes basically to indicate that they're um, they're going into um, mating season. And this is just a, a female mallard. Her head's facing the other way, but she's like got it tucked under um, her wing. I don't, it was warm out, so I don't know why the birds are acting like um, like they were cold. Maybe they just had been uh, busy all day and uh, and it was trying to get some. Um, some rest, but um, this bird was actually sitting right next to the male. Um, as usual, the male color uh, for birds is, you know, they usually have more uh, bright colors on their bodies, and it was also napping. Uh, it had its head tucked in here behind uh, the wing, and a cute little ducktail curl. So this is just a classic mallard, right? Um, with a little green ring around and the white around, ring around the neck and a little bit of blue on the wings. Um, but this were, these were in sort of like a little swamp area. And um, I don't know if I have any like overview images, but I also got these really nice close-ups. Um, I walked around the, um, the female mallard and got these really nice close-ups over the face. And I thought this was really kind of an interesting view. Um, I like like either this one, or this one, maybe this one the best out of them. Something like this. nice. Uh, a muskrat, I think. Um, I just happened to be swimming down a little river and uh, I saw it and I was like, oh, a muskrat. Um, and I took some pictures and then I turned around to monkey with some settings on my camera and I turned back around and it had just disappeared. Uh, somehow they just sort of like they have little holes dug into the sides of their river banks and stuff. And it's amazing how quickly uh, they can just kind of evaporate from the landscape if you're not looking directly at them. So, uh, this is a tufted tip mouse. These are on my bird feeder all the time, but it was kind of funny because I, um, this one was just out where the car was parked. <laughs> when I parked my car, uh, it hopped down and I uh, was hanging out under some pine trees. So I just went ahead and um, took a picture of it. Uh, they're cute little birds. Tufted titmouse is like, um, they like to eat uh, uh, peanuts. And I have peanuts um, in one of my bird feeders in the backyard. And so, um, but they're hilarious because they're little bird, right? It's like a chickadee, basically. It's like in the small, really small kind of bird category. Um, and they can just barely fit a peanut into their beak. And then they'll come in, swoop in, uh, grab a giant peanut, and it's basically the size of their whole head, and then they'll fly off with it um, pretty regularly. So uh, they crack me up anyway. Um, 
So, and they have these cute little, uh, I think any bird with a little uh, tufted part on the head uh, gets extra attention for being cute. Um, this is, uh, again, the Butterbutt, right? You can see they, the, the reason they have that name. Um, I got this bright, they have yellow on the shoulders. You can't see it from this image, but they also have this big bright yellow patch on their butt, so yellow rumped. Um, uh, warbler. This is a uh, pretty clear view of that yellow rumped. Uh, again, really common um, bird in these areas uh, in Indiana, especially in this part of uh, this time of the year, and then all through the summer we have them around. Um, this is again a palm warbler, so it's got like a red uh, cap and then yellow around the face and yellow on the tail. This is maybe a little bit better view of that same bird. Uh, anything in the background that has like blades of grass and stuff that look really bizarre um, when you're focused on something in the foreground and they get slightly out of focus, they look kind of mechanical or whatever. Uh, but that's just grass. Um, so these are all the birds that I got from... <laughs> Great username? Oh, the Diet Toms. Yeah. Um, and they stream uh, from the microscope, uh, Sam. So you would like them, probably. Uh, this is a, a cowbird, just on my bird feeder. So these are from... Um, yesterday. I think I took some pictures yesterday and these are from, from there. Um, the female cowbird has uh, just a brown body with this really um, distinctly sharp beak and um, the um, the male hey, cowbird uh, that goes with it this is a brown-headed cowbird, so that's the male and the female. Um, what happened? Sam Shung gave you a gift certificate subscription there, Diatoms. Thank you for that, Sam. Very generous, as always. Um, you'll be live tonight, likely long after I've gone to bed. Yeah. Um, that's what you get for being on the West Coast. But uh, Sam Shung is in, on the West Coast, so he may actually... Um, want to give you a follow and uh, and he might be able to make your stream. This is a brown-headed cowbird. Um, that's the male. That's the brown-headed cowbird, the female. And again, this really sharp beak, uh, like really sharp looking beak. And clearly they like whatever I put in the um, the best coast, yeah. Uh, Mama Bon Bon, can you recommend a site that will play bird calls with identification? Something new has arrived in your area and you can't seem uh, see to ID it. Um, I have an app on my phone that will actually listen to the bird noises and um, and try to ID it from the sound. And I don't know how good it is. Um, you know, just it, it comes back with some crazy stuff sometimes. But um, if you are just looking for, yeah, <laughs> you don't know what to do with your hands. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, I don't know. How long have you been streaming, uh, Diatoms? How long have you been? Um, I, I saw a bunch of videos from you, um, and you, you managed to accumulate something like four or 500 followers. So I don't know how, how rapidly that happens. Um, I think probably I got a whole bunch of followers when I first started, too. Um, because you're doing something interesting. Seven streams, yeah, so you're really just starting out. Um, this is a year and a half for me now, basically, so comfortable with it. And um, yeah, again, if you um, just made affiliate. Yeah, I noticed when I was in your stream that you didn't have any emotes yet or channel points, and I thought, oh, that's weird, he's got so many followers. Um, but you have to build up enough uh, streams, I guess, probably, in order to reach some threshold. I don't, I don't remember what the affiliate ones are, but it's a, it's fun to uh, to be here early in that journey. So very cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
um, I don't touch Reddit, um, but um, you know, people a lot of times. Uh, Dell, one of our um, our friends um, here. So uh, I should point out while you're still here, uh, Diatoms, that there's um, some people you should probably check out. So um, Pacific sent you some message, I think. Um, so Pacific Plankton's a moderator here. She does a um, streams from a light microscope. Um, usually it's once a week. Sometimes she can get a, a little more frequent than that, but recently she's had trouble even getting um, those in because she's been super busy. Um, Del Maxima is another great person to follow. Um, Del is uh, streaming, I think he's gone back to streaming on Monday evenings from the microscope a little bit, but he sometimes has Hydra and he's not a scientist, he's just a naturalist like um, Pacific Plankton, they're both naturalists. Um, and uh, Studio Cornix was in the channel with us, so you should give her a follow. She's an artist, but she does a lot of science and she just loves algae and um, she's almost always here hanging out with us. Um, uh, if you like um, mushrooms uh, and microscopes, there's uh, Michael Learning. So she's a, a relatively new streamer who does um, mushroom learning, mushroom identification. Uh, streams and uses microscope. Um, our friend Science um, does ants and they also do like microscope I think Mondays or something. I don't know which day that they stream microscope stuff but they're gonna be on the scanning electron stream with us tomorrow um, in the afternoon so um, there's a bunch there and uh, Sanophyte who's here in the channel um, was another person that you should check out. Hey Lady Gamer Ka, hello! Um, I just shouted out a bunch of people you got them, yeah. So, and um, I, can, I have a list of them, like a giant list of um, of microscope streamers, but um, I turned off that command because I'm trying to make one inside of um, the Orin board rather than using the bot. Um, but I haven't got around to it yet. So you'll see more of them come through, like Volcano Doc does rocks with a microscope and um, uh, Freckled Science uh, sometimes does uh, similar streams to, to the stuff that you do. She looks for water bears and just looks through pond samples and stuff like that. Um, yeah, Sinophyte's good. Uh, Lady Gamer Ga uh, is here and also a streamer. Like I said, I think my streams are almost all just streamers who like the cool stuff that I put up. Um, you getting ready for bed? Yeah, yeah. We're just looking at some of the birds that um, were on my feeder recently. This is uh, uh, the brown-headed cowbird, and I did a little bit of birding. Um, so these are some, that, they haven't made it into the stream, um, but uh, Sunday I started seeing them. So like I think I streamed from birds on Saturday, and then Sunday I had a whole bunch of new birds show up to the feeder, because it just got warm enough here. Um, so there's this brown-headed cowbird, and then uh, this is a, a rose-breasted grosbeak. You can see the name gros uh, is, that's like uh, French for big. Um, and you can see how huge its beak is relative to the rest of its face. It's got a big honker. And uh, bright red on the, um, the chest. This is the male. The female is just brown and white. But um, this has been hanging out on my feeder for the last couple of days. It just comes down and sits there and uh, starts singing trying to tell the its lady friends that it's found food, I guess. And um, uh, these are really pretty birds with this like bright red um, patch on triangle on their chest, basically. And because it's sitting on my bird feeder, I can just take all day and take as many pictures as I want of it. Um, so I did. Um, yeah, you want me to make, I could just add some wood chipper noises. Um, or I guess I could just blah, 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 like constantly make some sort of really annoying noise in the background. Um, yeah, sometimes my bird strings get attacked by the neighbor kid playing basketball, um, the neighbor over here mowing their lawn, the neighbor back there was chipping wood, cutting trees down. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, so we got this rose-breasted grosbeak. Uh, and then uh, just recently the Orioles started showing up, so I put out, um, I have this orange colored, I built all these bird feeders um, in my wood shop, um, and I painted the roof of this one orange because the Orioles are actually attracted to orange, um, 
Fobber, what are you doing here? Uh, uh, this is another great streamer for you to follow right there. You got Lady Gamer Ga. Uh, she does games and um, let's see. We'll do one of these commands. We do a who command for uh, for Bobber. Uh, our friend Bobber is here. You love birds. Uh, uh, mostly Bobber does gaming streams, um, but also they're a really good artist and sometimes they do some drawing. And uh, Bobber and I did a, um, a really cool uh, educational experiment um, doing like a VTuber university. And uh, last spring we ran one semester uh, and then we all ran out of energy to do it. Um, but we were doing VTubing uh, streams for educational purposes, so. Oh yeah. Um, on Saturday mornings, I do bird streams sometimes, or Sunday mornings, sometime on the weekend usually. Um, but uh, um, I might do one tomorrow morning. I don't know. I, I, the, there's a person coming to fix something in our house really early in the morning, so I might get up early and just try to um, do a little bit of birding. Um, so this is a Baltimore Oriole. Um, and they're attracted to um, orange things, including oranges, and also they like to eat uh, uh, jam. So this one is, actually I didn't look carefully, I think it's a male, um, but uh, it's standing on the roof looking at the jam, thinking I could get some of the jam in that jar pretty easily. Um, and I've been having to change the jam like every day because there's also a gray cat bird um, that has moved in also on Sunday um, with this bird and the grosbeak and it's like a whole a whole slew of birds came in that we don't haven't seen for um, for quite a long time um, but you can see kind of like the cowbird they got a really sharp beak um, both the um, the Baltimore Oriole and the rose-breasted grosbeak have beautiful songs and Baltimore Oriole song is just like this pure liquid sound um, and so um, I had put this out on Saturday, and I, I thought, oh, I don't know, it looks like it's going to get warm tomorrow uh, on Sunday, and um, and I put out the orange, and the orange, um, you know, I screwed the orange onto a little screw out there on that tree or on the uh, the bird feeder, um, and I hadn't got the jelly out there yet, and then um, oh no, I had a jelly out there, but I hadn't got the orange on it yet, um, and. I was sitting in my office and I just heard this noise and I was like, okay, that is an Oriole. And I said, you can just tell like immediately when you hear them, there's some super pretty songs. And um, when I looked and sure enough, there it was. So I scrambled to get my camera and um, they'd already taken off. There was two, two males, I think, and they were just pacing around this thing. And I came back, um, I opened up the window and then I just sat there and stared at my bird feeder for like three hours waiting for the Orioles to come back and it did. Um, so here's a, a little bit of that um, Baltimore Oriole when it got a little bit closer. I usually take a quick panicky picture which is what these are. Like oh my god it's here and uh, I just want to make sure I document that I got it and then uh, and then it actually moved in and started eating so I could take these a uh, little bit more relaxed photos but here you can see it's chomping away at the actual oranges um, Lady Gamer God, we have a feeder in the backyard but the squirrels were getting into it so we got one of the oh, that closes the weight of the squirrels on it yeah um, <laughs> squirrels are really devious um, I don't know if you when you were watching my stream if I showed we have just a squirrel baffle and that is the only thing that's ever worked. Um, I have this really funny, like when I first started putting bird feeders in the backyard, I didn't have a baffle. And the baffle is the only thing that's managed to keep the squirrels out of my bird feeders. Um, and you see them occasionally just sitting underneath the bird feeder looking up at that baffle because they can't figure out how to get around it. Um, it's just like a sort of like a, a dish, a plastic dish that sits on um, like it's something that it can rock easily. Okay, you're off to get your stream started. Okay, we'll see you later, Ty Toms. I'll, I'll, I don't know. I'll try to stop by um, if I can, if I can squeeze it in. Um, if not, I'll try to catch you next time. Um, if you give me your schedule, 
uh, it seems like you're on and maybe every other day something like that um, I can I can try to promote you a little bit more um, especially during my microscope streams like tomorrow and um, and anytime I do like the night microscope streams so um, very cool for you to come by and hang out and um, if you're not following diet toms not me diet toms but diet toms um, please give our friend a follow and I'm, I think you'll really like the content. It's pretty similar to what I do from the microscope. So there you go. Perfect. Yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, the uh, when I first got the, the feeders set up in our backyard, um, I tried all kinds of things to, to keep the squirrels from getting into the, um, from getting into the feeder. And people recommend all kinds of crazy things. So like we, um, less zen voice, it, you know, you got to be yourself. That's all I got to say about that. Um, the, uh, the first thing I tried was just putting some like vegetable oil on the pole. Uh, so that like when they try to climb up it, they'll slide back down. Cause people are like, Oh, you can just do this. It'll keep the squirrels off of the pole, but it didn't work. And then somebody suggested that you put a slinky, like, you know, like, you know, rolls down stairs alone in, in pairs, that thing, um, on the pole. And then when they try to climb up it, basically the slinky will uh, expand. But they figured out how to get around the slinky. Um, and then, I don't remember, we just went through like this whole long list of things. And I was like, finally, I was just like, let's just try a squirrel bat full. I put it on there and they never figured out how to get around it. Except, um, occasionally, if I have another feeder, like I sometimes put my hummingbird feeders out near the other one, um, if they'll, they'll climb up on that and they can jump over and grab onto the bird, um, the bird feeder, or uh, sometimes they figure out if they come along the wire, they can jump down onto the bird feeders. Um, so they do that. Uh, yeah, parkour. Yeah, the squirrels are really crazy. Um, but the slinky was the funniest one to me because it took them a while to actually figure out how to get around the slinky and I could just sit there and watch them uh, doing their best to try. And um, it was hilarious to watch while it lasted. But eventually they just stretched the sl slinky all the way out and then uh, they managed to get around it. So uh, don't try the slinky, not recommended. Uh, Squirrel baffle always has worked for me, and as long as you set it up right, they can't, mine can't figure it out, so that's slightly out of focus. That one's not, though. Here you can see its little tongue, uh, a little bit of its tongue sticking out. I think it was, uh, it was eating some of the jelly, and then, uh, you know, kind of like they throw their head back to gobble it a little bit. And its tongue is sticking, <laughs> sticking out in that photo. <laughs> it's a little bit of uh, either its tongue or some jelly sticking out on the end of there. But I think it's actually its tongue. Um, but the orioles are really pretty. Uh, we start off the stream with a um, a white-throated sparrow, and this is also a white-throated sparrow. This is uh, I think I actually collected this during the stream. Um, occasionally, I just see a picture and I want to go ahead and get it. Um, while the stream is going, um, it's a little bit awkward because you can see like it take the picture, and then if it's not a good picture, you can see me hitting the button a bunch of times and new pictures popping up. Um, but at least when I'm shooting through my camera, when I get a good one, I can just leave it up there for a second. Yeah, this is a very pretty, uh, very handsome bird. Um, White-throated sparrows come in like uh, I don't know if, if Sarah is still here. If Sarah is still here, Sarah would know. Um, but they have like a um, a matrix of uh, the white throats versus they have sort of like a tan throated version of the same bird. And the male and the female can have both white and tanned throats. And um, there's some people doing research here in our um, biology department that were looking at like whether the male with the white throat, that's a white-throated white sparrow, white-throated white-throated sparrow, or the tan-throated white-throated sparrow. Anyways, super complicated set of matrices, and they have some preference for um, for which color the throat actually is. 
um, but they're just morphs of the same species. So, um, but this is a nice. I think that's a nice picture. It just maybe needs to be a little bit brighter and um, the clarity just a little bit. Um, and then I also might send this through uh, to get rid of the the noise. There's a little bit of noise from the ISO again. Um, of course, that's you never you would never see that if uh, if I posted this to Instagram or whatever. Um, and then also as an example of like I kind of want its legs in the photo, right? Like kind of useful. Uh, I didn't get the whole tail, but uh, I think probably want as much of the buried in the picture as I can. So I make slight adjustments for that. Uh, just a robin. Uh, they always have dirty beaks. They've been digging around for worms in the yard. Uh, this one looks particularly mad at me, uh, which I find hilarious because they always look kind of angry. Um, and I like orange, so I like birds that are orange, especially even robins, even though they're really common. Um, I think this is a, a funny, funny bird, angry bird picture. Um, some more Oriole images. Uh, this is from a different set of Orioles. Maybe it's the same bird, but it came through. And uh, again, with the tongue out, there's the jelly. You can actually see a little bit of jelly in the bottom of the... <laughs> Keep my bird's names out of your mouth. Um, this, a uh, little bit of its tongue out again. Little burb. Um, and uh, a nice close-up of... Uh, that Baltimore Oriole. Bird's noses kind of freak me out. I don't know if anybody else has ever looked closely at like bird nostrils. I forget what they're called, but they are like rostrum or something. They have like this weird nostril. If you stare at it for too long, you, you'll it'll freak you out. And also you can, sometimes you can see through it on some of the birds. You can like actually see through the little nose holes, like completely through their mouth like you can see to the other side what's going on and I think you can kind of see that here there's a little bit of like the green sky in the background it freaks me out when I see it anyway um, uh, what else we got oh this is just a downy so this is my last uh, picture before I, I probably will stop soon um, but um, I have a bunch of diatoms I need to edit as well as images but um, but I don't think I have time to do it tonight, so maybe tomorrow night um, I'll do some uh, diatom colorizing. And I, I was thinking about making some new emotes, so I might probably try to see if I can turn some of these into um, something that's a little more useful. This is a downy woodpecker. Um, there was also a hairy woodpecker that occurs pretty frequently on my um, on my feeders. Um, we get um, red-bellied woodpeckers, downy woodpecker. Um, a hairy woodpecker, which is basically looks like a downy woodpecker, but has a longer beak and a bigger body. Um, this is a male. The male has a red spot on the head. The females are just black and white. Um, also true for the hairies, I think. And then um, we get uh, red-headed woodpeckers here. I've seen one on my feeder um, last year for a little bit. We had one that was coming in the yard. And then um, northern flickers. and. Um, again, on Sunday when I was looking out in the yard, I caught a northern flicker that was not on the feeder, but on the ground next to the feeders, and it was the first flicker I've seen for the season. So, like, just everything showed up on Sunday. Um, of course, I streamed on Saturday, so I missed all of it, but, um, hey, Dirty Smith, welcome in. Um, getting kind of near the end of my little photo editing, looking at birds stream. Um... Our friend Dirty Smith has been a friend of the channel for a super long time, and uh, like almost from the beginning. And uh, they kept threatening to stream from their um, their blacksmith shop, and uh, just couldn't get all of the things together. And uh, I saw now he's got it going, so uh, he's got the cameras set up a little bit in there. And um, I was watching a bit of your stream. I don't know, what was that, Sunday? Um, I was sitting here watching, uh, he has these giant presses that he uses to shape stuff, and, you know, like, 
you would do, I suspect, with a hammer in the old days, but um, these giant machines that kind of press the metal into shapes. And um, my wife came in and she was like, is that, is that metal that's just like flying off of there? Like molten metal that's just flaking off of the, the, you know, the thing that you were shaping? I was like, yep. Um, uh, crazy to watch, very cool. It's loud and dirty and hot. Yeah, I, th I mean, that sounds like a pretty good channel if you're out there looking for something to tune into. So um, please check out uh, Dirty Smith. And um, uh, and I've also been hanging out a little bit on the weekends also in Lady Gamer Gauze um, uh, channel. And they raided us with uh, Absolute Katie last time. Um, and uh, I saw that Katie was doing like a little workout stream again, was that Monday morning? Um, and hung out there in a little bit. She was doing like Richard Simmons workout, which uh, is absolutely hilarious to me. But uh, I see that um, Seek, our friend Seeky Wisdom, has been streaming for about a month now doing exercise. And now Absolute Katie's doing exercise. And I feel like you know, there's going to be a whole slew of seek related people that are going to be exercising, you know, getting into shape, uh, I guess for, you know, swimsuit season or something. Um, but, uh, I, I like to, I don't, I don't like watching people work out, but I like supporting people who are working out, uh, to try to keep them motivated because, um, you know, that's usually the hardest things, just lose your motivation and then, uh, everything falls apart. Um, uh, we also have in, in Indiana, we have two other types of woodpeckers to finish my thoughts. Um, there's the yellow-bellied sapsucker, which sounds like something that Yosemite Sam would call somebody, and I think he does sometimes, uh, but that's a, I've seen some of those and I've got some images of them, but they don't eat at feeders, they eat sap. And, um, uh, the pileated woodpecker also, but they don't come to my feeders, but I do see them in the woods around here. I saw one on Saturday when I was out um, taking some images, no, Friday when I was out taking some images from um, from Dobbs Park. So, um, so this is, you know, what we have for today, uh, doing a little bit of birds, um, taking a look at some of these goodies, and um, I think there's a lot of really good photos in here that I'll probably post a bunch to Instagram. Um, one of my problems with using Instagram is uh, I go out and I collect like, I don't know, 200, 300, 1,000 photos, and then I distill it down to like 50 photos, and I don't want to like throw 50 photos at everybody all at once, so I post like 10 of them. And then the next day I go out and collect another thousand photos and then, then, you know, distill them down to like 10 and then post those. And so like I have this backlog of photos that's always just like, you know, an order of magnitude, basically more than I have posted anywhere. Um, but once the moment passes, I just, they just disappear into my catalog of photos. I've got like hundreds of thousands of photos. Um, and I lose interest in posting them again. So, <laughs> do I need a Birds Attack account? No, um, I can I can stream whatever I want. Uh, if it's games, then it's games. If it's birds, it's birds. If I'm doing woodworking, it's woodworking. Um, I just have to put up with the people constantly coming in the channel and going, "That's a weird looking guy, Tom," uh, which I probably get, you know every other stream that's not a diatom stream so uh i just try to entertain them you know like when your parents make a joke and you don't want to make them feel uncomfortable about how bad their joke is so i just give them a laugh like that's a good one um even though i've heard it so many times it's definitely not funny um but you know i still want them to feel like it's funny um anyway so uh, i've got a bunch of cool birds here and um these I think are just the first in a long series of really cool warblers. Um, last summer we had bay-sided chestnut, magnolia, um, uh, just like almost every warbler I'd ever seen just came right into my backyard. 
Um, we had summer tanagers come to the backyard. Um, I don't know how many of those I actually got on stream, but um, we had a brown thrasher that's also living in the backyard for a little bit a couple of weeks ago. Never managed to get it on uh, on the stream, but I did get some pictures of it. Um, yeah, so, um, so I'll probably do some more photo editing streams soon, and then eventually we'll get a lot more flowers. I might do some macro photography uh, stuff as well. So, but I um, just thought I'd share a little bit of this while I was doing it anyway. And I'm going to export all of these down into something that I can uh, dump onto the internet probably. And um, I don't need to show that to you guys. And I probably will tweak some of these um, images a little bit to get rid of some of the noise. But um, it's really only a big deal for things that... I'm going to use as high resolution images for something. So for the most part, they probably aren't going to, you know, it's not going to matter. Uh, if I save it to Instagram, you'll never have seen any of that stuff. So, um, all right, let's call it a stream. This has been very fun, of course. Um, it's sort of like a, like a work along stream, which I don't usually do, except for when I'm on the SEM. Um, but I haven't done like just a photo editing stream in a really long time. So, I uh, thought maybe it would be a good idea and um, something I could do without having to go collect samples and, uh, and dig them out of a, and move the microscope out and everything else. So, um, so yeah, we'll keep it short and sweet, hopefully, and hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, just looking around at some bird pictures that I took and editing them lightly. Um, you know, they don't really require a ton. And um, let's go raid our friend Hannah, who I uh, can see is on streaming right now. And um, Hannah... Um, Hannah wrote a song about our stream, so uh, I definitely feel like when there's a chance to raid her, I, I should do it. So if you're not familiar with Hannah Rebecca music, um, she wrote the song, the Diatom song, Diatom Attack song, and uh, right when she first knew me, uh, and then I was uh, a little flabbergasted, honestly, to have somebody write a song about me, um, but I was so excited. It's really cool. Um, and also our friend Mel, um, who was here earlier, to give a shout out to our friend Mel, who subscribed, Mel I Am. Uh, another musician um, who's also working on helping write some songs for the channel. So um, please give uh, Mel a follow. She um, She's on like super early in the morning for me. Um, so I, I can only catch her streams when she does the night streams. But, um, you know, she's, uh, she's really fun. She sings a lot of fun stuff, plays a ukulele and, um, and keyboards. And... Uh, does some good, good, good taste in music, so um, a bunch of cool stuff. All right, small little raid. We'll take all of our people over to see Hannah Rebecca music. And um, she's doing some uh, atypical stream tonight. She's going to be doing some songwriting and then... Um, like finishing up the composition of some stuff or working on some old songs that she um, has on her list but hasn't played very frequently and then in between she's gonna like every other song will be one that people requested so um, uh, I always hang out in Hannah's streams whenever she streams if I can help it because um, I feel like uh, we're family there and um, so I hope you'll you'll come along and uh, give Hannah a listen um, if you're not already following her and, and listening to her. Um, I can push this button to do the ending screen now uh, to give out some thank you credits. Uh, these are people that have been hanging out with us. Uh, we got subscriptions from Diet Toms and from Mel I Am. So uh, two cool people you should follow their streams. Um, we got new followers from Diet Toms, Brian Breeze, who's another musician. Um, uh, the Silva, um, Jack Attacks You, uh, a bunch of these people actually followed me 
um, off stream, like before the stream started. Uh, Kibbles and Bits uh, famously hangs out with me in um, in Numb the Geeks channel, and um, just want to say thanks to everybody for hanging out. <laughs>